Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. I would really like to welcome you to our FAO Inputs webinar on the food composition of fruits and vegetables, which is uh, part of uh, the celebration of the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables that uh, is uh, being celebrated throughout the whole year of 2021. I would like to welcome all the panelists and uh, the um, and our participants. There are more than 200 participants registered and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, all the uh, great presentations that we will hear in this seminar. Um, Dr. Anatan will talk about uh, the richness of uh, Indian fruits and vegetables. Barbara Stadelmeier will talk about linking agroforestry to nutrition, the role of food composition in building location specific food tree portfolios for the diversified diets. And Daniela Mura de Olivia Beltrame will talk about uh, the food composition of 70 Brazilian biodiverse foods and how the data were used in the BFM project. Barbara Burlingham at the end will round up to say how to use compositional data of fruits and vegetables for policies and program design, implementation, monitoring, and in nutrition and in agriculture. So uh, really, we have uh, great panelists in front of us. And, um, and you all know how food composition is so important for everything that we do in nutrition, but also in agriculture. And um, this seminar really illustrates uh, the richness or the poorness of the um, of the compositional data that we have, and how this is then used to, to build up programs and policies. So, Anatan, you have the floor. You have twenty minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, <coughs> Is my PPT is visible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to one and all, both uh, the panelists as well as the participants. Uh, today, we are going to discuss something on the richness of Indian fruits and vegetables. And before, you know, the fruits and vegetables are very, very important parts of our diet. Always when we have the fruits and vegetables rich in our diet. And uh, it's a highly recommended for many health promoting benefits, mainly for lowering blood pressure, reducing the heart diseases in strokes, preventing various types of cancers due to the uh, antioxidative um, vitamins and the phytonutrients, and the lower risk of eye and digestive problems because of uh, lutein and zeaxanthins, and uh, having positive effect also on the blood sugars. Then the fruits and vegetables, always it's having the historically health place in the dietary guidelines, uh, mainly because of the uh, high concentrations of vitamins, particularly vitamin C and vitamin beta carotene and minerals. And, uh, and recently there are many phytochemicals or phytonutrients, especially the antioxidative polyphenols have been identified from many vegetables and fruits, which gives more health promoting benefits. But if you look at the consumption of fruits and vegetables, uh, I think globally, still it is in a <clears throat> lower rate, including in India. So it should be encouraged to enhance the intake of the foods and uh, fruits and uh, vegetables um, in order to get the dense nutrients. So coming to our Indian food composition or uh, the, the foods which we, we have collected. And in India, recently we have completed our Indian food composition tables in the year of 2017, where we collected the sample across uh, our country as a national representative sample from 107 regional uh, or, uh, the sampling sites from 630 districts which covers the 17% of the country. So once if we identify the sample collection centers, 
uh, the sample collectors or the samplers for each of the respective sample collection place. And then uh, they, they collected the samples and they brought back to the respective zones. So I forgot to tell you, uh, you know, our country were divided into six zones, north, south, east, west, central, and northeast zones in order to get the regional composite sampling. So in this respective zones, whatever the samples were collected, it was brought to the particular place that is called compositing center. So once the, uh, the samplers collecting the sample and they're reaching out the particular uh, composite centers, the samples were composited and uh, the composited samples were <clears throat> brought back to our institutes where all the nutrient analysis were conducted. So as soon as we reached the sample, uh, reached the laboratory, immediately we processed. And these are all the sum of the representative picture while doing the compositing. And uh, the samples were packed properly and without changing the cold chain with the continuous cold chain was lifted through air, it reached the laboratory. As soon as the sample reached the laboratory, immediately the samples were cleaned, edible parts were removed and the primary sample processing were conducted in order to start the analysis of very sensitive or uh, you know some of the nutrients as you know the vitamin c uh, b9 vitamin b9s are very sensitive so that immediately we have to start the analysis so we started immediately reaching this so all these samples uh, almost 550 discrete food samples which collected across our country and analyzed for almost 200 chemical components, which includes the nutrients and uh, bioactive substances, which have been published in the Indian Food Composition Table in 2017. This is also available freely in the PDF version. You can download it from the website, CDN Club. These are all the some of the representative pictures of our green leafy vegetables, which can be consumed across India, where the agati leaves, varieties of amaran, basella, batwa. So the list goes on like this, just for the representation purpose, uh, how our leafy vegetables looks. Similarly, the vegetables. Um, here, I, I, I just put, put, uh, I wanted to add here, the vegetables I have segregated into leafy vegetables and other vegetables. So you can see, this is a, this is a list of uh, some representative features of other vegetables with the ash guard, tender bamboo shoots, scarlet beans, bitter gourd, bottle gourd, varieties of brinjal, almost 21 varieties of brinjal we have collected. Then the raw jackfruit, it's used as a vegetable here, a drumstick, a green mango also used as a vegetable here, a fresh peas, the flowers of plantain, banana flower also used as a vegetable, and pumpkins, varieties of pumpkins, and snake gods. And similarly, these are all the, some of the fruits, uh, pictures you can see from apple to uh, wood apple, zizibas, all those things. So these are the, some of the representative picture where you also can see the complete list of the green leafy vegetables. There are 34 green leafy vegetables, which includes the different varieties of amaranth and cabbages, um, the gogo leaves, all those things. And uh, the list of other vegetables also goes like this, varieties of bitter guard, there are 21 varieties of brinjals, uh, different colors. Um, Anathan, could you speak a little bit louder? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, is it okay? Ah, is it louder now? Yes, very nice, thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, these are all the list of other vegetables and where you can see different varieties of uh, kowai, mango, uh, raw mango, green mango, tomatoes, different varieties of tomatoes, uh, different gods like uh, bitter god, snake god, um, and the uh, uh, ash god, all those things. And uh, the list of fruits goes like this, varieties of uh, apple, different varieties of banana, and uh, seven mango varieties and different uh, uh, grapes, all those things we have collected. So, so some of all these 
you can see 34 varieties, uh, 34 samples from the green leafy vegetables, 78 other vegetables, and there are 68 fruits we collected across the country. So uh, coming to the result, here <clears throat> I have represented, I have given only the proximates and important uh, uh, minerals, then um, uh, water soluble vitamins, which is very essential and the fat soluble vitamins. So let us discuss one by one in all these three different uh, food groups. Let's come to the proximate composition of the green leaf vegetables. I have uh, represented here in the logarithmatic scale and I arranged in the descending order of uh, protein. Among the green leaf vegetables which we analyzed, uh, more than 8% of protein we found in the agati leaves. So agati leaves is one of the uh, uh, leafy vegetables consumed mostly in the southern part of uh, India. And uh, then the next two agati leaves, the drumstick leaves. Drumstick leaves also is widely consumed in India, which has more protein. And uh, then the followed by the tamarind leaves, the tender tamarind leaves, which is consumed rarely in southern parts of India. And uh, this is a seasonally available uh, tender leaves. But these three leaves, it's very rich in uh, protein, as well as you can see the dietary fiber. It's a more than 8% of dietary fiber. So, so like that, you can see more than 5% of uh, protein observed in other green leafy vegetables like ponangani parsley and garden cress as well. There are some other, many other uh, green leafy vegetables also having good amount of dietary fibers, you know, the colocasia leaves and, um, and the particularly the ponangani also having very good amount of uh, dietary fiber sources. But if you look at the composition or the uh, complete composition of the proximates, more than 70% of the composition occupies only with the the water content. So if you come to the other vegetables, the proximate composition of other vegetables, uh, here also the same graph is represented. Uh, in, I have given in the logarithmatic scale and arranged in the uh, protein, highest protein to lowest protein content. And here also you can see more than 5% of protein observed in the jackfruit seeds, fresh peas and red gram, tender red gram red gram uh, leaves so and uh, more than six percent of uh, dietary fibers were observed in many green leaf vegetables which include the jackfruit raw as well as jackfruit seed and uh, the scarlet beans uh, fresh peas almost uh, close to six percent in the red gram tender red grams so you can see that the very good rich source of protein as well as the dietary fiber were observed in many of the green leaf vegetables which we collected uh, nationally. Coming to the fruits of the proximate composition among the 78 fruits which we analyzed, I just has given the mean of the variety. I have not given individual variety. Let's say the mango means I have taken mean of all the seven mangoes because instead of uh, making more crowdy, and you also can look at the our original database uh, for uh, the individual uh, values for each varieties. Here also you can see the highest protein. Uh, I, I have arranged uh, as per the descending order of protein. Here, the manila tamarind, it's aerial fruit. Uh, it's uh, seasonally available during the summer season and widely consumed across India. Manila tamarind, which contains more than 3.5% uh, of protein, followed by dried apricot and wood apple and avocado fruit, tamarind pulp, which had closely 3% of protein. In all these samples, in addition to these samples, you also can see the highest uh, dietary fiber content in the dates. Maybe these dates are dried dates. You can see only 15% 15 of water content, but the dietary fiber content was uh, especially a little higher when compared with the other fruits. Whereas the Coronda fruits, it's a 
um, uh, you know, in some parts of North India, the Karonda fruits are available. So these fruits, Karonda fruits, and Gawa also having very rich amount of dietary fiber. You can see the especially uh, the sapota. Sapota is very good source of uh, dietary fiber, close to ten percent of uh, uh, dietary fiber total dietary fiber were uh, found in the fruit samples. So here also, uh, the fruits are a rich source for dietary fiber as well as some of the fruits also having good amount of protein. Coming to water soluble vitamins in the green leaf vegetables, here I have given the top 10 samples which contain the respective uh, the nutrients just for the representation of the rich source of the plants in respective the nutrients. Let's say the top 10 uh, samples are the green leaf vegetables which contain the thiamine content. If you look at the highest thiamine content was observed in the green leaf vegetable called agati leaves. As I told this agati leaves, it's consumed widely and uh, throughout the year the agati leaves are available. Then followed by parsley, spinach. Spinach is having 1.16 milligram in 100 gram of uh, um, samples in the fresh weight basis. Similarly, Vitamin B2 or the riboflavin, you can see more in batwa leaves followed by drumstick leaves. It's close to 0.5 milligram per 100 gram of samples. However, the other samples also which have uh, you know close to 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams of uh, vitamin B2. Coming to niacin, among the uh, different leafy vegetables which we analyzed, the highest niacin content or vitamin D3 content was found in pumpkin tender leaves, tender leaves of uh, pumpkin almost to close to 1.5 milligram and then followed by garden cress and agati leaves again here also um, the niacin content was little higher range. Vitamin B5 or the pantothenic total pantothenic acid it uh, among the different leafy vegetables the highest B5 was observed in gogo leaves followed by Chinese cabbage again agati leaves. You, you can see here uh, the agati leaves, either in terms of vitamin B1, or B2, B3, and B5, it's occupying in the top three position. So, um, so uh, even the drumstick leaves also one of the important green leafy vegetables where uh, you know vitamin B2 and other uh, water soluble vitamins are very rich. Then total B6 content, which we analyzed. This is the total of all individual vitamin B6 vitamins like, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, perox uh, the PL, PN, and PM. So this we have given the sum of all B6, peroxidin, peroxyl, uh, peroxins all together I have given as a total vitamin B6. And among the different leafy vegetables which we analyzed, the highest B6 content was observed in the pak choy leaves and uh, drumstick leaves. It's close to one milligram per 100 gram of samples. And um, the total folic acid content in the green leaf vegetables, it's you know almost all the green leafy vegetables which contains a good amount of total folic acid content, especially the parsley and the colocasia leaves found to have uh, almost more than 150 milligram of uh, total folic acid. Coming to the total ascorbic acid, uh, you know, it's uh, well known that uh, the total ascorbic acids are rich in the green leaf vegetables. Among the different green leaf vegetables, what we analyzed, the highest green uh, total ascorbic acids we observed in the parsley followed by agati leaves and drumstick leaves. Here also, you can see the drumstick leaves in the vitamin B6 and the B, uh, vitamin C, which is a very good source for uh, uh, these water soluble vitamins. So among the different vegetables, See, agati leaves and drumstick leaves is widely consumed across a uh, country, which has very good source of uh, all vitamins, all water soluble vitamins. Coming to the other uh, vegetables, the thiamine riboflavin. Among the thiamine, uh, when, uh, among the different uh, vegetables which we analyze, the fresh peas occupies the top position in the highest content of thiamine, followed by the riboflavin. Riboflavin, uh, the scarlet beans found to have highest riboflavin. Coming to the B3, niacin, 
the red gram tender red gram also found to have the niacin is almost more than 2 milligrams of uh, niacin then the b5 also found to be uh, it is a good amount of b5 across all the other vegetables but uh, especially in the top 10 among the top 10 uh, baby corn occupied the first close to 1 milligram of pantothenic acids um, observed followed by zucchini and red gram tender red gram leaves then coming to uh, water soluble in uh, other vegetables like other water soluble vitamins like a b6 folate and uh, total ascorbic acid among the other vegetables different vegetables and the b6 content was very high in the french bean followed by field beans and uh, here the total ascorbic acid content especially was higher in the field beans uh, compared to all other vegetables which we analyzed and then even the, the red gram tender red gram uh, also found to have closely 90 uh, 90 micrograms and 100 gram of uh, uh, samples ascorbic acid was uh, favorably high and here among the different vegetables which we analyzed the capsicum was found to have uh, highest ascorbic acid followed by green mango a drumstick null coal and bitter gourd. Bitter gourd also occupies in the fifth position in, in terms of uh, rich in ascorbic acid. Coming to the fruits, uh, the vitamin B1 content in the different fruits which we analyzed, the tamarind pulp had the very highest vitamin uh, B1 followed by the um, apricot. The rib uh, riboflavin or B2 content was highest in manila, uh, manila tamarind followed by papaya, ripened papaya, then custard apple. And B3 was highest in the apricot, dried apricot and the tamarind pulp. It's closely 1.5 milligrams per 100 gram of sample. The B5 content was highest in the bell fruit followed by avocado fruit. It's more than 1 milligram per 100 gram of samples. You have one minute left. Uh, the other other water soluble vitamins you can see b6 was uh, high in the banana and uh, folic acid was uh, high in the mango and ascorbic acid was uh, high in the gooseberry uh, coming to the fat soluble vitamins also you can see the the beta carotenes or the pro uh, vitamin a caro uh, a vitamins uh, were uh, more observed in the amaranth leaves and uh, uh, then among the fruits, the date fruits are having more beta carotene. Uh, coming to the minerals, see I have arranged in the ascending order of iron. Among the green leaf vegetables, there are varieties of gogo leaves found to have more iron content. And uh, similarly, other vegetables, the clustered beans found to have more uh, amount of iron content along with the other uh, important minerals. The mineral content of fruits, especially the tamarind pulp contained very high amount of iron followed by the raisins and uh, there are many fruits also having the rich in calcium content so summarize uh, we have collected the 107 uh, uh, sa the samples from 107 sample collection centers 34 leaf vegetables 78 other vegetables 68 commonly consumed then uh, the leafy vegetables are rich source of uh, pro vitamin a carotenoids and total folates uh, also rich in vitamin C content in uh, almost all the leafy vegetables and fruits and very high iron content observed in the dry fruits followed by the green leaf vegetables and uh, leaves like uh, drumstick leaves, agathi leaves, ponangani are very rich source for the calcium and zinc content also was observed to be high in the leafy vegetables followed by fruits and other vegetables. So due to this richness, uh, it is recommended to you know, consume or include more amount of uh, leaf vegetables, vegetables and fruits in our daily diet to maintain good health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Anatan, for this uh, exposure uh, to the data from, uh, from India. It is really, it's a richness, uh, not only of uh, the fruits and vegetables in India, but the a richness of uh, analytical data analyzed uh, in a very rigid uh, way. And so if you have any, if you look for any good data, analytical data, so uh, this Indian food composition table is really a huge source. So he did not have time uh, to present all the uh, 
uh, phytoestrogens, the, uh, the bioactive uh, compounds that they have analyzed as well. But uh, all these data are in this uh, food composition table as well. And I guess uh, you will have seen some uh, leafy vegetables that you never thought that uh, they are edible. And they are not only edible, they are rich in, uh, in many of the nutrients. And in addition, they are, uh, they are really delicious. Having said so, I would like to give the floor to Barbara Stadelmeier, uh, who will talk. Uh, yeah, who will talk? Thank yeah, you, the floor, Barbara. <laughs> I'll share the screen. Okay, so good afternoon, good morning to everyone. My presentation will be on linking agroforestry to nutrition, the role of food composition in building location-specific food tree portfolios for diversified diets. As we know, food composition data are important for various reasons. Uh, knowing what people eat and which nutrients the consumed foods contain is key for assessing and improving diet quality. But it's also very important for agriculture to diversify the production with nutritious foods. Yes, and in this presentation, I'll focus on the role of food composition in the development of seasonal harvest calendars to provide for year-round micronutrient supply. And I'll highlight the nutritional importance of foods from trees and shrubs with focus on indigenous and underutilized species. Some background information to fruits and vegetables. As we know, fruits and vegetables are rich in vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and fiber, and they're essential for healthy eating. And diets rich in fruit and vegetables are important to combat micronutrient deficiencies, but they are also important as they lead to a reduced risk of non-communicable disease. WHO is recommending to consume at least 400 gram of fruits and vegetables per day. But we know that unfortunately, worldwide consumption is far below these recommendations. And this is particularly true for fruit consumption. As we can see on the left side, many countries are marked in orange or red, which means that they consume less than 50 gram of fruits per day. And there are various reasons for why we are consuming too little fruits and vegetables. This includes individual factors like taste, but also income, education, or also food safety concerns. But one of the main barriers, particularly in low and middle income countries and in the rural areas is a limitation on the supply side due to a lack of seasonal availability, but also due to inappropriate post-harvest handling or to limitations in value addition technologies for these perishable foods. And we know that in order to improve the global nutrition situation, there's a need to focus also on these underlying causes of malnutrition. And this includes also making agriculture more nutrition sensitive. And trees or agroforestry uh, has an important role to play here in diversifying agricultural production. Mm -hmm. So trees provide more than 74% uh, or se more than 74% of fruits produced globally are harvested from trees and shrubs. So they have really a big role to play in the uh, fruit supply. But trees and shrubs provide not only fruits, they also provide vegetables, particularly green leafy vegetables. They provide seeds, nuts, and edible oils. And as you can see on the left side, we have a picture of the baobab fruit. So the baobab tree provides us fruits, but we can also consume the green leafy vegetables of this tree. And this is also true, for example, for the cashews. So we can consume the nuts, but we can also consume the fruit. But trees also have other great uh, characteristics. So they have a high tolerance to drought and are therefore important at times when other food sources are not available. So they have the potential to really complement and diversify diets uh, through imp and, and thereby improving the diet quality. 
and they provide not only edible products, but they also provide medicines, they provide fodder uh, and timber, and they provide ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration and soil fertility. Uh, in our ECRAF project on food trees for diversified diets, the overall objective was to identify and promote the integration of food trees into farm and food systems to diversify diets and livelihoods of smallholder farming communities in East Africa. And the project took place in three different countries, in Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia, in different agroecological zones. And here we see an overview of the main steps that were involved uh, to address the location-specific harvest and nutrient gaps. So on the one hand, it's important uh, to assess the farm production diversity, including the uh, trees on farm, but it was also important uh, to assess uh, the nutritional composition at the individual and household level, including information on food insecurity data. And the production and consumption information uh, was pooled, uh, and this was uh, used to develop the food tree portfolios, which are defined as site or location specific combinations of food trees in order to provide year-round harvest, but also to fill the nutrient gaps in local food systems. But while the theoretical information is important, also practical guide, uh, guidance is important. So in addition, uh, demonstration plots and school gardens were established and trainings were provided and seeds and seedlings were disseminated. Uh, and in this presentation, yes, we will focus now on how we established and developed the food tree portfolios and how uh, food composition data was integrated in these portfolios. So in order to develop a food tree or fruit tree portfolio, it's important to start uh, with um, developing a seasonal calendar. And this was conducted in a participatory way with farmers and researchers. So which tree provides fruits at which time of the year? And this information was then mapped with uh, food security or rather food insecurity data. As we can see here, the food insecurity was up to 80% from August to November. And the aim was that each month at least one fruit species is ready for harvest even during this hunger gap. And with this approach, we could fill the harvest gap with ecologically suitable trees uh, for location-specific production. But we also wanted to include uh, or fill the so-called nutrient gap. And this is where we uh, mapped this data with food composition data. And I'll explain it now in more detail. So we had the selection of the important food tree species per site or for each location. And then we searched for food composition data. Unfortunately, as we know, there are hardly any data on underutilized species in food composition tables. Uh, so we checked the uh, scientific literature, but we also used um, uh, articles and several databases. Then we checked, we compiled, and we aggregated the data according to FEO inputs guidelines. And in order to simplify the nutrient content information for the portfolios, uh, we developed a scoring system so that we could score whether the food uh, is a high source in a respective micronutrient, a source, no source, or also provide information where we didn't have any data available. And uh, uh, we developed then the priority food tree and crop food composition database, which was published uh, end of 2019. And this database contains uh, 132 tree foods and crops from 99 species. The majority of the um, food items is on fruits, uh, but we also try to extend it to other crops. The geographical focus is in Sub-Saharan Africa, based also on the project. So we have 32 components, including proximates, vitamins, and minerals. 
and all the components are expressed per 100 gram edible portion on fresh weight basis. And in addition, we have the information on the scores that we uh, calculated for selected uh, components to simplify the information for the food tree portfolios. Yes, with regards to data reliability, unfortunately, we have quite many missing data, particularly for key nutrients like vitamin A and folate. But we hope that we can fill these gaps um, yeah, in, in the future. Uh, so here we can see uh, the online database. Here is an example of the tamarind fruit. Uh, you can search information per food name, per scientific name, or per food group. You can see we provide information on the components, but also on the tag name, on the minimum and maximum values, and on the number of data points. Uh, and other information is here on the scoring system. So, uh, for example, a, a food is a high score when it provides more than 30% of the required uh, nutrient intake of the respective nutrient. And we calculated the nutrient scores for selected nutrients. So for vitamin C, because it's high in fruits, but also for vitamin A, as fruits and vegetables are a major source of naturally occurring vitamin or provitamin A, and also iron and folate for public health reasons. Uh, and we uh, applied the FAOWHO uh, vitamin and mineral requirements and we calculated uh, the average for adults, uh, men and women for the recommendations. Um, so we have uh, the database is freely available and uh, you can download the user guide which contains all the methodological information. You can search online in the database, but you can also download uh, the um, database in form of an Excel format. And here is the link. Yes, another important aspect uh, in the project uh, of the World Agroforestry is the promotion and cultivation of indigenous and underutilized species. And as we know, these foods often have a great potential uh, to provide the required micronutrients. And they are sometimes even superior compared to commercial or uh, yeah, commercial or mainstream uh, species. And the good example is uh, we know that oranges provide uh, high vitamin C values, but when compared to indigenous species like baobab or marula, or even many more, most probably, they provide up to five times more vitamin C than oranges. This is just to highlight and to show that, yes, we should look more also in the nutritional composition of underutilized and indigenous species because they have a great potential. Um, here we can see, uh, okay, uh, yeah, the location-specific recommendations for Kitui. Altogether, we have, uh, found 19 food tree species and shrub species in this project, and they were identified across eight sites. And yes, we have the information on the month of food insecurity. Here is again the seasonal calendar, and we can see which fruits are available or uh, which trees provide fruits in which time of the year. We have the information uh, on the iron, vitamin A, folate, and vitamin C content in terms of scoring, whether the food provides a, is a high source of vitamin C or only a source, or whether either it's, it's low or where we don't have information, unfortunately. And we extended um, this approach and also included uh, vegetables, but also pulses and staples that are growing uh, in this specific location. Um, yes, uh, here we can see an overview then of entry points for agriculture and nutrition behavior change activities. As I mentioned already, it's important to have theoretical information, but it's also important to have practical guidance or trainings and uh, agriculture and Nutrition Innovation Hubs were established where farmers retrieve trainings on agroforestry and tree management, uh, but also seeds or in, in seedlings were disseminated. In addition, um, with the local partners always, uh, also um, ICRAF established or implemented uh, school gardens 
where children could really learn like hands on growing uh, trees and uh, getting trainings not only on nutrition but also on agricultural practices. Yes, and uh, in cooperation with Jomo Kenyatta University, uh, processing trainings uh, were conducted uh, to also increase the income and in examples here on, on tamarind. Yes, to conclude, uh, tree foods, as you could see, are really good sources of many micronutrients and they have a great potential to diversify local diets. And the portfolios uh, that were uh, developed, they provide an example of how agriculture may be used to promote nutritionally rich diets, particularly for rural areas, which predominantly uh, rely on uh, the production on farm. But we, can all, we could also see challenges with regards to food composition that uh, there is a lack of availability and good quality food composition data, particularly for unutilized species. The aim, nevertheless, is that we regularly update and extend the database for new species, uh, but also for yeah, additional information per country, region, or cultivar, or whichever information we find. And of course, if there are funds available, nutritional analysis would be great. Uh, among the next steps is uh, also to we aim to link the food composition data to other databases from ICRA, for example, the Vegetation Map for Africa, uh, which includes uh, a species selection tool to find the right tree for the right place uh, for forestry, but also agroforestry and also restoration planning. And it would be great to really link it with uh, food composition data. Uh, here's a list of some publications where you can find more information on the food portfolio approach, but also the link to the database and uh, book chapters and the link also to the project site on the food tree project for diversified diets. And I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara, for this uh, uh, very useful uh, information on how to go from food composition to uh, to uh, a calendar and to to use uh, the food composition data in in food programs and stuff. Um, may I ask uh, the participants uh, to uh, put your comments or your questions into the chat or into the Q and A section? So, um, so that we will have at the end uh, some very rich discussion. Um, having said so, I would like to give the floor to Daniela. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you for the invitation to present today. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. Uh, so I will, oops, one moment, please. Um, I will present about um, the food composition of 70 Brazilian biodiverse fruits and how these data were used in the Biodiversity for Food and Nutrition Project or BFN project for short. Uh, I was the national project coordinator for this project in Brazil. And the, it was implemented from 2012 to 2019 in Brazil, Kenya, uh, Sri Lanka, and Turkey. Um, it was coordinator, coordinated um, globally by Bioverse International with implementation support from FAO and UN Environment and funded by Jeff. And the objective of this project was to strengthen the conservation and sustainable man management of biodiversity through mainstreaming into national and global nutrition, food and livelihood uh, security strategies and programs. Uh, the project was uh, divided in three main components. Uh, so our activities were based um, on, on these components. The first one uh, was the knowledge base um, the project meant to increase the knowledge of how food biodiversity 
can contribute to diverse diets and nutrition. And the food composition work um, was um, mainly inside this, this first component. The second component was about policy and regulatory framework. Uh, the project targeted uh, policy instruments with the greatest potential for diversifying and improving diets while supporting family farming and sustainable uh, practices as well. And the third component was about awareness raising. Uh, many of the activities of these components were, were very much related to the other two. Um, so we aim to improve national capacities, uh, uh, create partnerships and raise awareness through alliances with universities, government sectors, uh, civil society and the private sector as well. Um, the, um, about the knowledge base. Um, so the project selected uh, 70 species of fruits and vegetables uh, that had been um, previously identified uh, uh, by the Plants for the Future initiative. This Plants for the Future initiative um, is, a, uh, is a project from the Ministry of the Environment in Brazil um, that it's an inventory of native underutilized species that have social importance and economic potential. And the project selected uh, the edible species from this inventory and established partnership with, uh, partnerships with um, research institutes and uh, federal universities in, five, in the five uh, geopolitical regions of Brazil to uh, gather food composition data, uh, to develop recipes and also um, do some other activities related to raising awareness about these foods. Uh, and the, this food composition work uh, was decentralized. Uh, so we had the species uh, divided by, by region and each region analyzed the species that were native from, from there. Um, in a first uh, step, uh, data, uh, food composition data was compiled from uh, scientific publications or reports in national food composition tables that were available. Uh, this was done by master students recruited by the, the project. And uh, data was found for 49 species uh, of the 70, but uh, it was scarce for many species um, uh, for dietary fiber, for vitamins and minerals as well. And this data that was selected for these 49 species, um, we had also to uh, carefully go through the data and select and, and, and uh, select only the ones that we had absolutely uh, certainty about the quality. Uh, so we, uh, we ended up eliminating um, a lot of data that was compiled because of poor quality of the data published. For example, uh, there was no clarity about which part of the food was analyzed or uh, in which uh, basis the, the data was, um, was expressed. Um, so in the end, um, the project decided to do a laboratory analysis uh, for the 70 species as we would do uh, analysis for vitamins and minerals because there was uh, not much data on them, uh, we ended up analyzing proximates as well. And this data was then included in a food composition database that was developed by the project um, and it's available online. I will quickly go through the database here. So we have the the list of the foods, we have um, 186 foods for the different species because we have, for example, uh, one fruit with peel, uh, another entry only the pulp without peel and seeds, and so on. Uh, and of also different parts of the foods, um, like seeds uh, or, um, or pulp. Uh, so for the 70 species, we, we have more than 70 entries, let's say. So you can search here for the food you want and you will have uh, the food composition uh, data available. 
and this both from the laboratory analysis and the and the, the compilation from from published literature and you can see the individual sources of data so far as example for this fruit uh, called burichi we have six different sources of data and you can see the mean data here combining the six of them and you can access also the individual uh, uh, foods uh, individual individual entries and if you have a login you can edit or include the data directly here uh, or through um, an excel file uh, based on the the, the compilation tool developed by FAO in Foods. So you have the tag names, you can add the data and you can add also the, the documentation about this data. And some tag names, the system will calculate the mean, for example, uh, energy, the sum of proximates to avoid uh, mistakes due to, um, to the source of data. Okay, so, um, Besides the, um, the regular uses, let's say, for the food composition data, such as making uh, the data available for calculating menus and, um, and other types of and, and, uh, food consumption surveys and all the other uses that food composition data has, we use this data to inform public policies that were partners of the project. And we did this uh, by highlighting some examples of rich um, of fruits that were rich in some, some nutrients. As the examples I brought here, if we see, if we take uh, three of the native fruits, uh, Pitanga, Tucumã, and Buriti, many of these fruits, by the way, they have in, uh, names given by the indigenous people from Brazil, um, most of them actually. So we can see that they can be as rich or even um, uh, more rich in vitamin A than other fruits that are considered good sources of these vitamins, such as carrot, passion fruit, papaya. The same for vitamin C. We have here some examples, uh, kagaita, mangaba, camu camu. They can have um, uh, more um, amounts of vitamin C than citrus fruits that uh, when we think about vitamin C, they are uh, one of the first that come to mind. And uh, other example uh, for the protein content of some uh, native uh, nuts and seeds, uh, when compared to other commonly consumed nuts and seeds, such as walnut, flaxseed, and almonds. So uh, we use this data uh, to inform uh, some public policies that were partners of the project. Um, this was the structure of the um, of the partnerships. Let's say so. We had we had many different ministries that implemented many different policies that are um, listed here, and the project worked together with them to try to uh, include uh, biodiversity uh, for food and nutrition. And these policies were related to nutrition, to education, uh, to agriculture, and to income generation as well. Uh, for example, uh, we have the school feeding program and the food acquisition program. Uh, these two uh, programs, they had very good uh, entry points for biodiverse foods. For example, they link family farmers to institutional markets. 30% um, of the foods purchased uh, by the school feeding program must come from family farmers. And the food acquisition program, it's uh, totally focused on family farmers. They pay a premium price for organic and agroecological foods. They prioritize uh, purchases from indigenous quilombolas and other traditional communities. And schools in traditional communities receives, uh, receive more funds also for school meals. Uh, and in addition to, um, to giving them the, the food composition data, we needed something that formalized the role of biodiversity on food uh, and nutrition security policies. So we had the list of foods from the project, uh, but the partners required something more official that they could uh, really use to base their actions on. Because as I said before, these foods, they, they are underutilized and they are not very known, or maybe even if people know them, they don't know how to eat or if they are edible at all. 
Some of them are very well recognized, such as acai, for example, that is uh, now is uh, found even in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, but some are only known regionally or locally. So the, the list of uh, fruit species from the BFN project um, was published as a formal public policy, as an ordinance from uh, the Brazilian Ministry of the Environment and the Ministry of Social Development. And it's the first policy in Brazil to define and support nutritionally important native species. And this, uh, the publication of this list uh, facilitates the inclusion in institutional procurement, facilitates the monitoring of purchases from, from these um, procurement programs, and offers also more opportunities for smallholder producers that, that produce or gather these fruits. Uh, for example, the list from the ordinance is being used um, as a basis for a label called the social biodiversity label. In Brazil, we, we use this term social biodiversity. This is also defined by our legislation is the combination of the biodiversity or our native biodiversity with the social uh, and cultural aspects related to them, the, the cultural knowledge uh, related to them. So it's not only that uh, these foods are native, but they have some importance to, to the communities that uh, utilize them. And producers of foods uh, that, that are, are on the list, they can apply to use the social biodiversity label. And um, it's also being used to guide the, the farmers on how to access the food acquisition program uh, they can see which foods are listed and, and, and uh, sell these, these foods to the food acquisition program, sell to the government. In relation to uh, the school feeding program, uh, besides uh, that the food composition data can now be used for calculating menus for the schools, uh, they included uh, the, the list of foods, of social biodiversity foods, as one of the criteria to give um, a, a quality index to the meals. Uh, so for example, the, the menu of the school gets a higher uh, quality index if it has the presence of six food groups, if it is uh, diversified, uh, if it doesn't contain some foods that are classified as restricted, such as uh, sugary beverages and sweets and uh, the presence of regional and social biodiversity uh, food species adds points also to the menu. Um, other examples of policies and plans that were influenced by the, pro the project, uh, it's the National Plan for Food and Nutrition Security, National Pact for Healthy Food, uh, the National Plan for strength in Strengthening Gatherers and Rivering Communities, and the National Plan for Agroecology and Organic Production that has one of the axes give, uh, guiding the, the activities of this uh, plan um, is uh, social biodiversity. Um, and also as possible, uh, the project included uh, data about these foods in publications from the partners, partner ministries, such as these publications directed at uh, the Health in School program, which is a program that promotes healthy eating habits in school. Um, the Regional Foods Book, that uh, is a recipes book de uh, developed by the Ministry of Health. And the Food-Based Dietary Guidelines published by the Ministry of Health in Brazil as well. Uh, in addition, the food composition data was used uh, to calculate the, um, the recipes in a recipes book that was developed by the project in partnership with the universities. And we reached out to, um, uh, to journalists and uh, we had uh, many media releases highlighting the richness of the, the, the species. And they published some, um, some articles, for example, for the general public in the Health Magazine, which is uh, one uh, magazine that is uh, very widely circulated in Brazil. And one of the biggest uh, um, publishers in Brazil, they also uh, published a book for the general public 
based on the list of foods uh, from the project and highlighting the, um, the nutritional composition. Uh, the book, for, for instance, is called uh, 50 Brazilian Plants and Fruits that Can Boost Your Health. Also, uh, uh, the project was featured in TV shows and interviews, and this was uh, very important to reach the general public and not be only restricted to uh, public po uh, policymakers and researchers. Uh, and uh, also the, the data was highlighted in symposiums and gastronomic workshops uh, directed at uh, public policymakers and researchers. And last but, uh, but not least, uh, the, the project developed an online course about uh, mainstreaming biodiversity for food and nutrition and uh, its benefits for agriculture, health and livelihoods. Uh, it's available for free uh, in the project website. Um, and that's all for me, from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Daniela, for highlighting how food composition data uh, can be used in, uh, in influencing policies and programs and to reach the general public. And again, now I, I think you really nicely showed, like Barbara before, how uh, the difference is in some of the indigenous food compared to mainstream fruits and vegetables. So that is really nice. And with this one, I would like to give uh, the floor to Barbara Bollingham. Barbara? Just a second. Here I come. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Ruth. So thank you so much for being here because I know it's uh, one o'clock in the morning for you. <laughs> yes. All right. So let me share my screen. Uh, Can you see the screen? Perfectly well, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so uh, thanks. For, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak at this uh, symposium. Uh, it's a topic I don't get to talk about that much, uh, even though for 30 some years of my career, it was entirely focused on food composition. I'll talk about, um, I could talk about so many things, uh, but I thought I would focus on policy. Uh, and for a number of reasons uh, that, that will be clear as I go on. Food composition research and food composition data in different sectors uh, is fundamentally important, whether those sectors realize it or not. Uh, and food composition data does underpin all policies in nutrition. It can provide the evidence base for many policies in health, uh, and it should inform uh, many policies in agriculture. Food composition, as we've heard in all of these presentations, defends with great strength uh, the fight against biodiversity loss through uh, con conservation, uh, conservation through sustainable use, it supports food industries and, it, um, and food composition data are being more and more used now to monitor climate change. For policy, I suppose the most uh, important, most powerful uh, and uh, the biggest policy instrument right now and for the next uh, decade is um, the sustainable development goals, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the sustainable development goals, 17 of them. So we moved from the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, which were eight, I believe, into the Sustainable Development Goals. And these are all relevant, some indirectly, some directly uh, to food composition. Um, and as we, uh, as we see the United Nations taking more action for advancing the, um, the goals and, and the specific targets within these goals, uh, we now in 2021 are seeing a big focus on 
2, SDG 2. The short name of SDG 2 is Zero Hunger, but the long name is End Hunger, Achieve Food Security and Improve Nutrition and Promote Sustainable Agriculture. And this is the theme for the upcoming Food Systems Summit in uh, September 2021. Even though all the SDGs are integrated, um, we can pull out individual ones and, and even individual targets within goals uh, and address them and then put them back into the big picture. And that integration and that, um, and that um, requirement for these um, sustainable development goals to interrelate uh, is important. And it is, uh, it's fundamental to what we all have been doing in food composition for decades, and that is integrating the sectors of health, agriculture, and the environment. Uh, one of um, the important targets within SDG 2 is target four, to ensure sustainable production systems, didn't mean to do that, um, that help maintain ecosystems. And target five, to maintain the genetic diversity of seeds, cultivated plants, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and this has, for, for many sectors, this has uh, kind of been a separate issue for food composition. But then in uh, 2013, the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture took some steps uh, that were uh, useful, I think, for food composition and to look at the big picture of the ecosystem. The ecosystem was the fundamental uh, unit by which sustainable diets were developed. Uh, and ecosystem services is an important um, an, an important concept, I think, for uh, for the, certainly for the environment sector, but also for food and nutrition. Food has always been considered an ecosystem service. What was new in 2013 and not new anymore is that the concept of nutrients in food and whole diets should also be explicitly regarded as ecosystem services. So basically they said that Food composition, which is the concept of nutrients and foods and analyzing them and, uh, and compiling and disseminating those data. This is an ecosystem service. They also said that uh, the nutrition community and particularly um, the, the food composition community should develop guidelines for mainstreaming biodiversity into policies, programs, and national and regional plans of action on nutrition. And this, I think, has been achieved very well over the, uh, the last several years. And I think particularly well, as we just heard in Brazil, uh, with the uh, Biodiversity for Food and Nutrition Program. And it has been well mainstreamed uh, in that context. The project, in Brazil, it was a four country project uh, and it was really meant to be, and the expectation was uh, that it would be a model for um, projects elsewhere in the world. And it really hasn't succeeded that well elsewhere. In fact, even in the four country project, Brazil was a country that did better than the other three countries. Why is that? That's something that needs to be analyzed. and. Uh, and the success and, and that wide policy and program integration that was achieved in Brazil is, is the ideal and, and the, the good model system that needs to be recreated elsewhere. So biodiversity is uh, diminishing. Here's just an illustration that shows uh, some of the um, some of the biodiversity within species uh, of common fruits and vegetables and how little, uh, how, how many fewer there are now from a hundred years ago. 
So this is by this biodiversity loss is um, an erosion. It's a, it's a loss of from the diet. It's a loss from markets, and it's a, it's a loss from ecosystems. And some of it is permanent loss. And food composition can do a lot to champion and defend that biodiversity. And here's one good example of biodiversity defending, um, or, or let's say, nutri uh, let's say, uh, food composition defending biodiversity. Here we have a project uh, that is ongoing even to this moment. Bio um, it includes biodiversity, it includes food composition, and it is traditional food systems of indigenous peoples. Uh, in this case, there was a, uh, a 12 country uh, analysis uh, and uh, 12 case studies in different countries. The basis was the indigenous groups and the uh, experimental design looked at the food systems and all the associated um, benefits or, or not from, from how that food system had evolved. Uh, and one of the case studies took place in a Pacific Island nation, Federated States of Micronesia. And there for um, some period of time uh, after, the, um, after the industrialization and the import of, uh, of foods from, uh, from developed countries, the, uh, the, the traditional food supply, the traditional diets um, were forgotten and uh, imported foods were consumed. The consequence was, uh, among other things, vitamin A deficiency, particularly prevalent among children. It led to um, cases of night blindness, beto spots, and even blindness in children. Uh, the curious thing about Micronesia was that uh, the, this was a rather new phenomenon when it emerged in around, in around the 1950s. Uh, and there was a researcher there who was curious about the emergence of this, uh, this vitamin A deficiency problem. She wondered why, she looked at the ecosystem. She saw that there were these very um, deeply colored, banana varieties uh, in the jungle, growing wild, uh, dropping to the ground. Uh, people weren't eating them and they were actually importing the Cavendish banana. We have uh, a beta carotene or, or let's say a pro-vitamin A carotenoid content of the Cavendish is basically zero. These banana varieties have uh, pro-vitamin A carotenoid content uh, up around uh, 8,000 or more micrograms per 100 grams, mostly beta carotene. Uh, and the difference between a child eating this banana and this banana is the difference between a vitamin A deficiency and vitamin A adequacy. The other interesting um, phenomenon that took place uh, while this study was being done, the, uh, the researcher, her name was Lois Engelberger, wrote a series of papers. She sent them to the Journal of Food Composition and Analysis for publication. This was um, more than 15 years ago. And I was the editor. I sent these papers out for review. And one of the uh, foremost authorities on beta carotene in, in fruit wrote back and said, reject this paper. We all know there's no beta carotene in bananas. But there was, we didn't reject this paper, and there is. Uh, but, but it's one of those situations we find in nutrition often where we think we know something. We haven't analyzed it. We have preconceived ideas about, um, about miscellaneous things, and often we're wrong. So it's worth, uh, it's worth, the, um, it's worth the analytical effort. Uh, and I applaud uh, India for all the uh, extensive analyses that they're undertaking, looking at nutrient content at the level of the, the cultivar or the variety. Another example, and this one uh, relates to policy in the agriculture sector. This was another paper 
looking at alpha and beta carotene in sweet potatoes. You'll see that there are some varieties with extremely high content. This has been recalculated to milligrams per 100 gram fresh white. Uh, and there are some with quite low uh, content. The significance of this study, okay, it examined the biodiversity and the nutrient content, but it also looked at the varieties that were being recommended by the agriculture extension workers in the country. And this was all over the Pacific. This one actually happened to be in Hawaii. And they found that the, uh, the extension workers were recommending to the farmers that they plant these low beta carotene varieties of sweet potato. Why? Because they, they didn't know anything about the nutrient content. It wasn't, it wasn't available to them or, or they didn't care or didn't look. What they did care about was the slightly better disease resistance of these varieties uh, and maybe slightly higher yield. But once they were made aware through the activities of the food composition community that there were these higher, better uh, varieties of sweet potato, uh, they began um, recommending these to, to the farmers for planting. And another vitamin A deficiency problem was solved. Uh, and these food-based approaches to solving the problems of malnutrition uh, are still not as widely used as they should be. And in fact, I, uh, and if we talk about policy, I recently looked at the agenda for the next uh, World Health Assembly coming up next month. Uh, and they talk about vitamin A, they talk about eye health, uh, but their main focus is still supplementation and not food-based approaches. If we look at the biodiversity of something like rice, you can see that the, the, um, the values are quite different. Protein, uh, a low value of five and a half grams per hundred grams, a high value of uh, 14 and a half. Uh, these are statistically significant differences. Look at how many samples were analyzed, uh, but they're, they're just even much more importantly, nutritionally significant differences. And these are based on the, uh, the, the biodiversity, that genetic resource itself. Other factors, of course, we all know can influence the nutrient content, but for this study uh, and for many studies, uh, it can be um, assumed that most of the reason for the differences are the genetic resource itself, not as much for nutrient elements like zinc, uh, but certainly for micro, micronutrient vitamins, for example, where you've got your biosynthetic pathways uh, that uh, dictate to a, to a large extent uh, the amount of these um, vitamins that, that we find in, uh, in rice in this case, but in all fruits and vegetables. So we have high varieties, low varieties. We've got orders of magnitude difference in, in some of these nutrients. And if we go back to the ecosystem and we, uh, and we look at policies related to look, looking at the bigger picture, we are, we are reductionist um, scientists. We, we, take, uh, we take an ecosystem, we take a diet, we take a food, we, we take a nutrient and we look at that, we study that nutrient and then we put it back together. But looking at the whole ecosystem, it's very interesting that uh, more and more um, commodity uh, councils and things are looking at the, the bigger picture. And, uh, and this is an old example, but a useful example of something that the International Rice Commission did. They recommended to member countries that they should promote the sustainable development of aquatic biodiversity in rice-based ecosystems and that policy decisions and management measures should enhance that living aquatic resource base. And this is almost the antithesis of what normally is done uh, in these commodity commissions. This is basically saying, we don't care about intensification. We want, uh, and 
not so intensified system so that you have these other, this other biodiversity. An intensive rice-based aquatic ecosystem, all you have is rice, you have nothing else. But the population living in those ecosystems and eating out of those ecosystems don't get their micronutrient adequacy from the rice, they get it from the other organisms in that system. Uh, they also recommended that where wild fish are depleted, that rice fish farming should be considered as a means of enhancing food security and securing sustainable rural development, and that attention should be given to the nutritional contribution of aquatic organisms in the diet of these people and, and looking at the nutrient content of not just the rice, like we did here, but all the other species in there, the wild uh, and uh, often underutilized species. Climate change is another uh, important um, area that food composition can make a, a contribution. Some of the early studies uh, that, that I was aware of uh, related to say fish and the fatty acid composition of, um, of marine fin fish, especially, uh, and how that would change with the changing in um, the change in sea temperature. Uh, but here, but here are some others related to uh, CO two and fruit and vegetables. Uh, and um, and this one, uh, the bottom one here was just published uh, last year, and it's about it's a review. It's a good review on climate change impacts on food security, focusing on perennial cropping systems, in other words, uh, uh, trees and, and the like, uh, and their nutritional value. And uh, a lot of policy can be informed by the food composition work that you do um, in these systems, looking at nutrients that are vulnerable to, um, to climate-related change. The high-level panel of experts recently um, published a global narrative. Food composition was uh, mentioned a few times, uh, but it was um, implied uh, through many of the recommendations. Uh, for example, um, the, this global narrative, which was presented to the Committee on World Food Security at its last session, uh, recommended facilitating biodiversity conservation through sustainable use by promoting the production and consumption of nutritionally rich, neglected and unutilized species and local varieties. This has been said over and over and over again, and it still needs to be said. And food composition. Minute. How many? One. One minute. Okay. Uh, and um, and also moving from the concept of nutrition sensitive agriculture, which is very weak, to something a little more powerful, nutrition driven agriculture. Uh, the right to food is important. I just want to mention uh, that one of the recommendations from the high level panel was for the CFS to expand the definition of food security. We all know about the four elements of food security. The recommendation was to add agency and sustainability. Agency is important uh, and because I think of it as more like power to the people and for people taking their nutritional adequacy into their own hands, planting a tree in your yard, making your uh, vitamin C adequacy, your own personal responsibility, those kind of things uh, relate to agency. Also giving people and communities a seat at the table of powers where policy decisions are made. I won't go on to that. There are a couple of new things I think everybody should have a look at. It's relevant to food composition. Yesterday, Barilla came out with the brand new um, double pyramid. Uh, looking at the impact on the environment of uh, of eating, this is uh, this is useful, and food composition data inform uh, the development of this. And then um, also yesterday, uh, this is my second to last slide. A uh, a paper came out in Nature, Nature Food Transitions in Nutritional Science. What struck me most about this paper was this paragraph. It was the second sentence or, or third sentence. Elsie Wittison and Robert McCants 
were among the pioneers of modern nutritional science sciences. Their work, daring, meticulous, and pragmatic, pushed boundaries in the understanding of food composition. Elsie Wittison and Robert McCants, McCants and Wittison, they are the great grandparents, the great grandmother and great grandfather of food composition. If you don't know about them, you should know about them. But importantly, at the end of this little article, it's an editorial, they say that a uh, nutrition science community has responsibilities to engage with and communicate to the needs of policymakers. And this, I think we need to do more. Sometimes it feels like banging your head against a brick wall, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's something that needs to be done, needs to be continued. And I think we can all be like McCants and Woodison, daring, meticulous, pragmatic, and keep on pushing. So, uh, so I look forward to uh, the, the uh, Food System Summit in 2021. Hopefully something uh, good will come out and advance the, S, uh, the SDGs. And happy um, International Year of Fruits and Vegetables, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. And by the way, to really everybody of uh, the speakers, uh, you have uh, presented uh, the different aspects of uh, fruits and vegetables, their composition and how they should or can be used uh, to inform policies and uh, programs. And uh, really, thank you so much. That was uh, a very rich uh, presentation, each of you. And uh, let me go and let me say also a very big thank to uh, Sol Ruiz, who is uh, the IT person helping us uh, in conducting this uh, seminar. Um, we have uh, some questions. Uh, so uh, let me start with, uh, with Anatan. Um, you have presented a lot of data. So were they analyzed raw or cooked? Uh, or did you also analyze vitamin B12 and cobalamin? Yeah, we analyzed all the raw foods, not the cooked form. It's and about B12 in fruits yeah. and vegetables? Mm, unfortunately, we have not done B12 analysis uh, due to some technical reasons. Okay. So, and how did you select the fruits and vegetables to analyze according to consumption uh, or what were the criteria? According to the consumption. According to consumption. Thank you. And um, then there is another question for you as well. For the vitamin C, uh, um, how much remains in the food when it is uh, consumed? Uh, no, I don't have data, the retention of vitamin C when it consumed. Yeah, so uh, you got uh, the foods from the market. So this represents the foods which are in the market. They are not representing the food that are coming out uh, from the tree or from, uh, from the agriculture area. So this is then representing the food uh, as consumed. And uh, sure enough, when uh, we are cooking foods, we all know that uh, the, uh, um, the content will be reduced, especially of vitamin C. So yes. if anybody else would like to chip in, so please do so. Um, anybody would like to say something in addition to this point? No? So um, then uh, there were some other questions on the scores of uh, that Barbara Stadelmeier presented. Uh, was it on a 100 gram edible portion basis or another one? Yeah, it was on per 100 gram in a portion. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then there were some comments uh, saying, you know, really wonderful discussion, very um, precise and good presentations. Um, and uh, it was so good to add the photos because a lot of people don't know the, the fruits and vegetables that were presented. So seeing the photos, it gives... Uh, it gives an idea of how they are looking like. 
Um, and uh, I would have uh, some questions as well. So to the presenters, um, do you think that uh, what you have presented would have been possible uh, without the knowledge of the fruits and vegetables of their food consumption, uh, food composition? Probably, Daniela, you would like to start? Yes. Uh, yes, no, it wouldn't be possible. I think the, um, at least in the work that we did for BFN, uh, for the Biodiversity for Food and Nutrition, the food composition data all, always had a lot of impact on how people perceive the food, uh, these foods. We, of course, we have the cultural links, but when we said, when we show them, um, and this by them, I mean everyone, uh, researchers, um, farmers, when we show them, look how rich this food is, um, they were uh, enchanted, let's say. Uh, they were, oh, I didn't know. Yes, my grandmother used to use that as a medicine. Uh, oh yes, my grandfather used to eat that and say it was healthy or something like that linked to traditional knowledge. And this also rescued uh, some of the, um, the knowledge they had about these foods that were uh, being lost, let's say. Um, so I, I, I think this was a very big, the food composition work was a very big part of the work that we did uh, with the BFM project. And it really helped to showcase the foods. And uh, as we could see on the slide, the, 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 the fruits, they, they are very rich in many, um, many nutrients. And those are only some examples um, and we have many more. Um, so yes, I think was really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara and Barbara, would you like to add something? Um, you first, Barbara. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's so many things that we couldn't do without the food composition data uh, and, uh, and so many problems uh, that are created when the compositional data are not known. Uh, and we see it in um, we see it in uh, kind of the competing policies between health the health sector where where food is different from nutrients and nutrients are medicine to cure the diseases of uh, of deficiencies um, and we see that uh, in in fact even from the early my early days in FAO we had. The, um, the, the economists of the world uh, running the show, and they were the ones saying, if we supply the dietary energy, which is really the basis for food security, everything else will follow. Of course, we know it doesn't, and, uh, and it wasn't until there was uh, an abundance of food composition data presented uh, in, at one of, in an aggressive way that it was finally realized that dietary energy supply will not solve the problems of malnutrition in the world. We need those micronutrient data. We wouldn't need it if we were living the way people lived a uh, hundred years ago, where, where your food system was your ecosystem. And if people had thrived and survived for millennia, then you know that that ecosystem is delivering the nutrients that you need, but with the artificial food supplies that we have and the industrialization and monoculture of agriculture, we need those compositional data more now than ever before. Thank you. Barbara. Yes, I think it's uh, food composition data definitely important also for the work that we did at ECRAF. And I think it's key also for promoting food based approaches really to highlight what's the natural content of micronutrients in foods. And also, as I showed the example, also to highlight these underutilized or forgotten species and show they have a great potential. Yeah. So, uh, Anatan, you wouldn't like to add? Yeah. So, always food composition is very important for in terms of uh, fruits consumption. Recently, I could see a number of people, they are inquiring about uh, 
which food is having more vitamin c particularly in pandemic condition you know so they wanted to know the uh, uh, vitamin rich foods or uh, micronutrient rich foods in order to keep their uh, you know immunity power as well so they are looking forward for getting more information on the uh, food composition so this this is very important uh, one of the criteria you know the public also is getting awareness i hope it may increase the consumption of fruits especially the fruits consumption in india mm-hmm. yeah so um, so we know that these data are so important and uh, on the other hand we also know that uh, hardly any funds are available to uh, to analyze them and to uh, yeah so um everybody would like to have this data and uh, and india is one of the rare examples where we have a food composition table where the my, the vitamin values are analyzed as as well as all the others and in as uh, daniela um, and as well uh, barbara stadelmeier they pointed out in their um, presentations when they did literature research and uh, we have uh, encountered the same kind of problem um most of the vitamin values which we find in food composition tables uh, are purely um estimated based on on analytical data on very 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 few uh, fruits and vegetables and also for for any other foods so uh, and this has really huge implications for for policies because uh, a lot of policies are based on uh, inadequacy of intake and uh, if the food composition part is uh, very very weak meaning it has a huge impact uh, on the uh, on the um, uh, confidence interval meaning on the quality of uh, of this data um probably we have not a real good idea of the real uh, extent of micronutrient deficiency that are really uh, present in the different countries and um and i would like to add uh, there is a really very nice article which recently came out in food composition in the journal of food composition and analysis on vitamin a the dilemma of uh, of the data the data use uh, and the data availability and uh, the rdi which is there and uh, and again even looking at this article it uh, you have to take into a consideration that most of the um, vitamin in food composition table also for fruits and vegetables are estimations they are not analytical and therefore um i would like to uh, to to have a little bit uh, of discussion for 5 minutes or 10 minutes that are left in this seminar to see what we can do uh, to have uh, many more analytical data um including on fruits and vegetables uh, and for the vitamins and minerals that we have here so um i would like to open the floor on this discussion point So probably Anatan uh, and Daniela how did you manage to get the money to do the analysis that you did Yeah uh, for uh, <clears throat> so when we develop our indian food composition table our ministry that's a ministry of health and welfare funded for our project it's a nodal ministry for our uh, um, organization also so that funding was sufficient for uh, establishing our facility including uh, all the essential equipments developing a methods purchasing various crms and srms uh, so now we have established full fledged laboratory to study all types of uh, the micronutrients you know including vitamins and that too uh, we could able to detect up to a nanogram level using sophisticated equipments so now we are working continuously with various um the with the request uh, which we receive from various other countries as well so we are analyzing it so we could able to manage and if anybody needs help from our uh, facility also we can we can extend our 
uh, help to others. Thank you. Daniela uh, and also Barbara, so you also presented some of the analytical data that you did. Yeah, so we were able to do the, the analysis uh, because we had funds for the BFM project that came from uh, Jeff. Uh, so a big part of the funds um, that were uh, available for, for the first component of the project went to the, uh, for the uh, laboratory analysis and also for the food compilation. Um, but we were expecting that this um, could bring more funds from the government, for example. Unfortunately, due to the changes in Brazil, the economic changes, the political changes, this, was, this didn't happen. Uh, we didn't have more funds from the government. And I think it's key to involve the government. Um, the Ministry of Health in Brazil used to fund a food composition table, which is the more complete that we have, uh, which is only analytical data. It's called um, TACO. Um, and it's the best quality, the quality that we have for uh, Brazilian foods, foods that are produced and consumed in Brazil. Unfortunately, this uh, project was discontinued and um, yes, um, I think it's key to involve the government and uh, to also to build capacities in the different uh, in different universities, for example, so they can analyze this and publish in a way that this data is is useful for uh, food composition tables and not only for um, scientific publications or articles. They have to describe the food in a certain way and to include the uh, details that um, facilitates the, the compilation of this data from the articles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Barbara, would you like to add something? You mean me or you mean yes. Barbara? Yes. Okay. Barbara Okay, well, actually, we didn't have uh, funds for doing analytical work. I mean, we had some projects funds where I analyzed, for example, the uh, vitamin content and some mineral contents of baobab. So it was, uh, yeah, basically funds related to projects, but we had no bigger funds in really doing, uh, yeah, analytical analysis. So this is our wish for the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um... So this is the wish for the future and uh, probably I would like to, uh, to close this uh, webinar with uh, this wishful thinking for the future that uh, we will have more analytical data for fruits and vegetables as well as for other um, uh, foods so that uh, we can enrich really the, the program and, uh, and the policies and inform them and uh, have like Barbara Burlingham was saying, we should have a much more uh, food-based approach using the huge amount of richness uh, that we have in the different countries, even if it is only locally or, uh, or, or regionally, but uh, use it. And uh, one of the things that uh, Barbara said and struck me a lot and what I have heard of many other um, uh, countries as well, a lot of the fruits and vegetables that are really rich in, in nutrients, they fall off the trees because, and they are never used because people don't know that they are so rich. And uh, with these ones, they would not need to have uh, some of the supplements or the fortification This is ongoing. So we have a chance of, uh, of changing the way of how we look. And we can only do it if we involve more the, uh, the governments and more the people so that they are aware of uh, the uh, richness of the foods and the, uh, the fruits and the vegetables that they have. And before closing, I would like to give the floor to everybody to uh, make a small statement if they wish. So uh, let's start with Anatan. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruth, for giving this wonderful opportunity. This is my second uh, series of your webinar, and I'm very privileged to present our data. And I uh, would be able to present only a few data where uh, you are. Uh, so, if anybody wanted to know more 
analytical data on our Indian food, so they can visit there. And uh, I, um, you know, uh, I'll be happy if you are uh, arranging the like this is many other uh, uh, webinar series, particularly to get more knowledge, uh, the young birds, those who wanted to enter into the food composition analysis. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Anatan. Barbara Stadlmeier. Yes, I would also thank you very much for the invitation that we could present our work here. Uh, yeah, and um, I hope that we will all um, take this opportunity also to, in, in our case of tree foods, to think like, uh, yes, we can actually eat trees or like fruits are coming from trees a lot and uh, appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Daniela. Um, yes, uh, Ruth, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Thank you for the opportunity. And I would like to, um, to recommend something, if I may, to the attendees. Um, if you work with nutrition, if you are a researcher, a professor, uh, encourage your students to learn about food composition. FA, FAO in Foods have wonderful resources. They have an online course that is really uh, easy to take and that can open many doors. And uh, the students can learn, uh, the researchers can learn how they can publish the data in a way that the data can be used uh, for food composition um, purposes. And yeah, as I said, not only uh, for uh, scientific publications, but that this data can be extracted and used in the real life, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara rolling in. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, thanks, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to see everybody again. Uh, it's a lot of uh, old familiar faces and some names. I, I scrolled through the names of the list of the uh, participants. Uh, and so hello to everybody. Uh, and I would like to, uh, I think, encourage people, especially the young people, to get involved at the, at the policy level. And the most important involvement right now is to engage with uh, the process of the um, Food System Summit. They're developing documents, they're, they are open, they're, there are calls for um, participation. And if the food composition community can engage with them and get food composition uh, addressed, uh, get food composition into the documents, all of which are relevant, uh, then I think um, it, it's an opportunity not to miss. And already I've read one document, uh, Defining Healthy Diets, <clears throat> which really doesn't uh, do justice to food composition work or any of the work on sustainable diets or anything. Uh, and, I, and I think people need to, um, to find out who is involved your countries are all active in this uh, and to engage yourself, go to the websites, make comments, get your, um, get your viewpoints into, uh, into the conversation because it will be meaningful for the next decade as we uh, try to achieve those sustainable development goals. And Ruth, best wishes uh, to you uh, for your future. Thank you. <laughs> well, then, um... I would like really to thank every of the uh, panelists again for their excellent presentations and insights and uh, presenting really how useful this data is and how it can be used and uh, that we have to do much more in order to get more funding and policy um, commitment um, in order to, uh, to produce more data and to use them. So, because also sometimes uh, the food composition data are as these rotten foods, which are not really used. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's time for feeding. And uh, I would really like uh, to thank uh, the, the panelists again, and also uh, the audience, and again, uh, Sol Rus uh, for her support in, uh, in doing this webinar. So thank you so much to everybody and uh, see you in the next uh, um, webinar that we have uh, 
in Spanish for the first time uh, tomorrow on the same theme. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.